Well, good morning. Here we are, August the 15th, halfway through the month, and we're looking in Ecclesiastes 7, verses 11 through 22. Where is the balance? The balance. Balance, definition, harmony, or to equalize, a happy medium. The wise person realizes God offers wisdom to the imperfect. The imperfect. I wonder who that could be. Us. The imperfect. As we uh, begin our study, uh, I'm going to read all the verses and then go back and, and uh, dissect it. That's the right word. Uh, look at each one. So here we go. Starting in verse 11 through 22. Being wise is as good as being rich. In fact, it is better. Wisdom or money can get you almost anything, but it's important to know that only wisdom can save your life. Notice the way God does things. Then fall into the line. Don't fight the ways of God, for who can straighten out what he has made crooked? Verse 14. Enjoy prosperity while you can. But when hard time strikes, realize that both come from God. The way That way you will realize that nothing is certain in this life. 15. In this meaningless life, I have seen everything, including the fact that some good people die young and some wicked people live on and on. So don't be too good or too wise. Why destroy yourself? On the other hand, don't be too wicked either. Don't be a fool. Why should you die before your time? So try to walk a middle course, but those who fear God will succeed either way. 19. A wise person is stronger than the 10 leading citizens of a town. This there is not a single person in all the earth who is always good and never sins. Don't eavesdrop on others. You may hear your servant laughing at you. Verse 22. For you know how often you yourself have laughed at others. Let's go back. The first part is broken down into acceptance. Acceptance. Verses 11 through 14 in Ecclesiastes. Being wise is good as being rich. In fact, it is better. And so what he's saying is like being wise is like an inheritance. It's something that you gain and usually without, without working for it. And when we think of an inheritance, we think of, of wealth. Uh, and what Solomon is saying here is that that wealth, that extra income, whatever, can give you an edge over other people in the way you live. Uh, you know, it, it helps you keep from struggling so much as the next person. Then it goes on, and wisdom or money can get you almost anything, but it's important to know that only wisdom can save your life. And so both wisdom and wealth can be a protector in, in life. In Hebrews, Protection means the shade of, a, of a, a large tree. And the idea is that this shade provided by this tree protects you from the sun and the rain and other elements. And this is what he's saying that wisdom and wealth do. It can pro provide a barrier between you uh, and other misfortunes that come your way. Uh, but th the idea is that... Uh, as, as Solomon has said so many times, wealth can be fleeting. Uh, we all know how things uh, that we, we plan on, like a savings account, uh, investments and everything, depending on the economy, uh, it can be wiped out in, in, in very little time. And so, but what he's saying, and he's also saying that, you know, it doesn't guarantee against your ill health or even uh, your death, uh, whether it be through accidents, uh, disease, or whatever. Uh, but it says that, you know, wisdom produces a better life 
and that it can bring godly wisdom to the person which leads to eternal life. This is what he's saying, is that wisdom can give you life. Wisdom in God can lead you to a, a salvation experience with him. And so uh, it helps us to realize our need for God. Uh, we may need money to get us by, but we can't depend on that, uh, you know, making things continually better. Like I said, it's fleeting. But our dependency upon God and God himself is the only constant in this world that we know of. He is dependable through and through, time after time. And so when we think of, of wisdom and wealth, that it can give us security. In the end, our wisdom, our knowledge of God and our relationship with him ends up being the only thing for sure in our life. Then we go down to verse uh, 13. Uh, notice the way God does things, then fall into line. Don't fight the ways of God, for who can straighten out what he has made crooked? Uh, I can't think of the man's first name, but his last name was Blackaby. He wrote Experiencing God, and he wrote in, in that. That's a, an evangelistic approach to reaching out to people. And in that he wrote, find out where God is and join him in his work there. And to me, this is what Solomon's saying. You know, don't say, okay, okay God, here I am. Uh, come show me what you want to do. You look for where God is working and you go to him uh, uh, seeking to uh, apply your life and your ability to furthering God's kingdom where he's working. And, and, and I see this in, in John, our pastor, uh, is always looking uh, at ways to uh, further God's kingdom here on earth through our community outreach, uh, through our, our podcast and everything. He has found where God is working and he feels, and, and I, I do too, that God is working through Exchange Avenue Baptist Church uh, at this time. And so he is putting his effort, his time uh, into developing things through our church to further God's kingdom. He is finding out where God is and improving or devoting time to that and energy. And I think that's what Solomon is saying. Find out where God's working and go to him and join him. And it says, you know, don't fight the ways of God. Who can straighten out what he is made crooked? God is perfection. And we may think, well, in our vast wisdom, we know better. Uh, th thing that I think of the times in my life where I think I know better, uh, but I just dig my hole a little bit deeper. And so we, we need to realize that God is perfection. We may not understand his ways, but the thing is, we need to accept the fact that he knows what's best. And so we are of no consequence. We do not have the position, the wisdom, the knowledge to say, God, I think you should have done it this way. So what he's saying is that God is perfect and God doesn't make mistakes. And so we need to accept the fact that whatever befalls us, it comes through God first. Then verse 14, uh, enjoy prosperity while you can, but when hard times strike, realize that both come from God. That way you will realize that nothing is certain in this life. It's funny, God has made both prosperity, the good times, and adversity, the bad times, in our lives. And that this is what we'll encounter uh, as long as we're here on earth. And so we need to be thankful for both. Now, it's easy to be thankful for the good times in our lives, but it is very difficult to be thankful for the bad times in our lives. Uh, I think it's 1 Thessalonians 
says, and everything give thanks uh, to God. Uh, and so when we see that things aren't so easy, you know, this is a time that maybe God is, is teaching us a valuable lesson. And usually it's, to me, to be more dependent upon God. And so God knows what is best for us. We need to trust God even when we don't understand why something is happening in our lives. And so with God always being in control, the wise person accepts whatever God brings our way. And we rely upon God to help us through these times. And so that God's plan will ultimately prevail. And that's either with or without us. But in it better be on the winning side and to obey God and follow through with him. So in, in, in these few verses, it talks about accepting. And it's basically to accept what comes our way and relying on God to get us through these things, to help us understand the best that we can. Now, we'll never completely understand God's ways, uh, but we, we need to accept these things and, you know, put our trust in Him to help us get us through these times in our lives. Now, the next part is find balance. That's not all easy to do. Sometimes it feels like we are really on the wrong end of the scale, doesn't it? Find balance, Ecclesiastes 7, verses 15 through 18. And under the title of my Bible, it's the limits of human wisdom. In this meaningless life, I have seen everything, including the fact that some good people die young and some wicked people live on and on. We talk about Solomon's life. And many times he has stated that life is futile, which means it's meaningless. And he's saying here, <clears throat> excuse me, in Solomon speaking, in my meaningless life, in my futile life, I have seen everything under the sun. Think of that. His riches enabled him to experience everything from A to Z in a person's life, good and bad. And so in the end of his life, when basically he let the, his wives and their gods take over his life, uh, he was basically a whipped man, not because of his wives, but because of his lack of strength and, and, and uh, righteousness in God to overcome these various idols. Uh, and instead of standing up for God, he caved in and turned to worshiping idols. So when he says that his life is meaningless, he is again stating that, you know, I just found nothing to be worthwhile. And that's sad. Sometimes we get that way. We get a, a defeated attitude that, you know, what's the sense? What's the use? I'm not going anywhere. I'm just spinning my wheels. But we need to keep our faith in God. And God will see us through. Maybe not to the extent that we think it ought to be, but to the extent that he knows it should be. And so, and he, and he goes on and says, I've seen everything, including the fact that some good people die young and some wicked people live on and on. Isn't that true, at least in my experience, that we see good people, bad things happen to good people, and we don't understand why. I think probably there's times in all of our lives we have seen that. Why, God, is this happening? This person is such a good person, a godly person. Why is that happening? And then you look over here. This guy is living for the devil 24-7, and yet 
Look how well off he is. Look how he's living. He is, you know, going on and on, living longer than this righteous, godly person has. Why? And, you know, we, we can't answer that. But the thing is, is that, you know, we need to understand that uh, this this is the way life is. The idea that, you know, well, it's not fair. Well, what is fair? You know, we go through life saying, well, that's not fair. That's not fair to me. And, and you know, life isn't fair. <laughs> that's a gimme. Life isn't fair. But Solomon is, is looking at this from what he has experienced, and I think it, it tunes in with what we see, why some people can get away with murder, so to speak, and other people, it's a struggle every step they take. And, you know, we don't understand that. And it does seem meaningless in our lives but we got to keep the faith then it goes to verse 16 so don't be uh, too good or too wise why destroy yourself that's, that's kind of weird isn't it don't be too good or too wise and in the, in the quarterly, it talks about being excessively righteous or overly righteous or overly wise or too wise. And so in Solomon's time, the idea of righteousness was gained by right living, uh, keeping the law. And we know that from study, especially the New Testament, it was impossible to keep the law. Yes, the basis of the law was given by God to Moses, but over time, men had added their own little quirks, their own little ideas to it, to where a person, even if they locked themselves up in their home, still had, had the uh, possibility of sinning. And so, you know, Solomon's saying that, you know, righteousness you gain by right living by keeping the law which is impossible and so to obey the law you need to be perfect well there's only one perfect that has ever been and that was jesus christ so the idea of excessively righteous refers not to the pursuit to faith in god or a right relationship with god but to the feudal uh, efforts of living a legalistic, self-righteous life. You put yourself up on a pedestal thinking how holy I am. And that's false. And then it's, it's by works that we see ourselves being righteous. And so what he's saying being overly righteous, being self-righteous means that you're controlling your own destiny instead of letting God control it. And it's by works, not by faith. And the same holds true of being overly wise or too wise. The, the, old, uh, the old saying, uh, being too smart for our own britches. And, you know, maybe some of you never heard that. Uh, but it's, it's more or less saying that, you know, well, I know better than you. Uh, I'm much more knowledgeable. Uh, I know what's best for me. And so instead of trying to manipulate uh, God's favor by our actions and not by our love and our joy and our serving God, we are failing. We are tending to destroy ourselves by being self-reliant and not God-reliant. We're trying to save ourselves under by our own power. And that only leads to failure. 
Only God can save us. Go to verse 17. On the other hand, don't be too wicked either. And don't be a fool. Why should you die before your time? Solomon, it sounds like Solomon said, okay, you'll be, you need to be a little wicked, but not too much. You need to be a little bit of a fool, but not too much. But that's not what he's saying. He's not saying some sin is okay, uh, but don't overdo it. Uh, I, I think it was Paul that said in one of his writings, either Paul or Peter, saying, you know, does it mean that being being saved uh, and forgiven my sins, that I can sin more to show how grateful and forgiving God is? No. And this is what Solomon is, is, is saying. You don't need to, to uh, have sin in your life. It's not okay to sin a little. Sin, sin. Whether you think it's a little or a lot. But Solomon's not saying, you know, a little bit it's okay, but don't overdo it. But to me, what he's saying is that you need to find the happy medium because we are all sinners. Was it go back to that said? God offers wisdom to the imperfect. We are the imperfect. We are the sinners. And so we need to find that peace, that harmony, that balance in our life that only God can give. He's the one that brings balance into our life. And that was the, the, the heading of, of these verses right here. Find balance. How do we find balance? Through a relationship with God. Now we go to the verse 18. It says, so try to walk a middle course. But those who fear God will succeed in the way. So we need to take hold of God's righteousness and not our excessive self-righteousness and his wisdom, not our worldly wisdom. And how we do this, how do we do this? By fearing God. Remember, fearing God is the first step toward wisdom. And not only fearing God, but living by faith in God and trusting him. Again, this is what brings balance. And what's it say? This brings us to a middle course. This brings us to a stable uh, way of life. Now the next part is called acknowledge sin. We need to see and acknowledge that sin, sin, and that we have sin in our lives. Verse 19, a wise person is stronger than the 10 leading citizens of a town. Now, it was customary for towns to have like a group of leaders to help govern and rule uh, that city. Uh, problems arose, these guys got together and come to a solution. But what Solomon said in here is that with God giving wisdom to a person and not relying upon these 10 guys and their worldly wisdom, but he's smarter. He is more capable of solving the problems and coming to a correct solution than these 10 guys are because they're dependent upon their own knowledge, the worldly knowledge, where the wise person is dependent upon God-given knowledge. And so, you know, we're talking about our God-given wisdom. And God gives us wisdom. We need to ask for it. I mean, as soon as we're, we accept Christ or ask Christ into our lives and he forgives us of our sins, he doesn't just say, poof, you're wise. No, wisdom is something we learn over time. Something that we gain. It's knowledge, and we grow it. It grows in us. The more time we spend in God's Word and with Him, the wiser we can become. And so this is what he's saying, is that, you know, 
It's wiser for a man with God-given wisdom than a group of men who depend upon their own interpretation of the situation. Now, verse 20. There is not a single person in all the earth who is always good and never sins. Think about that. There is not a single person in all the earth who is always good and never sins. How true that is. And Solomon is talking about now, his time. But that is prevalent throughout time itself. No one is perfect. We are all sinners, uh, even you and me. Now, I may look at somebody and say, well, I'm glad I'm not as bad a sinner as that guy. Sinner's a sinner. A sin's a sin. We may rate it bigger and small, but that's for our own gratification, our own smugness, our own idea that, well, I'm not as bad off as that guy. But Paul said in Romans 3.10, there is no one righteous, not even one. We all are sinners and we fall short of the glory of God because of our sin. And this is what Solomon is saying. Nobody's perfect. Whether you're rich or poor, no matter your circumstances in life, we are all equal at the foot of the cross and we're sinners. But the difference is knowing Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior helps change our life. We are still sinners, but we are forgiven. We are given wisdom to live as close to a godly life as we can. God has given us that wisdom to do that. Verse 21. Don't eavesdrop on others. You may hear your servants laughing at you. This seems kind of odd, maybe. But to me, he's saying, don't pay attention to those who badmouth you. There's going to be people who Talk behind your back. In fact, more people are going to talk behind your back negatively than they do to your face. Uh, and so, it's the old saying, stick and stones may break my bones, but words will never harm me. Well, that's what he's saying here. Our tongue can be an extremely sinful organ. In fact, it states where, you know, the tongue is... You can't put a rein on it. Sometimes it's uncontrollable. And so instead of focusing on what others may say negatively about you, we need to turn our focus toward God and the positive things of God. You know, people talk about others uh, in negative ways. And if we don't hear it, you know, that's fine. But if we do hear it, what good does it do to get upset about? Because sometimes there may be a little bit of truth in it. And so we need to ignore that. Now, verse 22. For you know how often you yourself have laughed at others. Don't listen. Let's go back. Don't eavesdrop on others. You may hear your servants laughing at you. That's 21, 22. For you know how often you yourself have laughed at others. So this verse refers back to 21. Haven't we done the same thing? Haven't we talked about others behind their back? Usually in a negative way. It's I forget how it goes, but something like you go home and have roast preacher for Sunday lunch. And the idea is that you pick apart a preacher's sermon. And, you know, to me, it's because of the attitude that you 
went in with to start with. I, I hit on last week about our attitude coming to church needs to be in the right frame of mind. And so we need to have the right frame of mind and knowing that this person over here isn't doing anything uh, different that we ourselves have done concerning others. Now, that may be a hard pill to swallow. You may say, well, I don't do that. But the thing is, we may not voice things, but how many times have I looked at somebody and think, you know, what's wrong with them? Why don't they do this or that to better themselves? We don't know their circumstances. We don't know why they are like that. But basically, we're sitting in judgment of others. And that's wrong. That's a sin. Only God can judge us. And so this, to me, what's, what Solomon is saying is that, you know, don't get down on others because we have done the same thing ourselves. We aren't better than anyone else. That's Sometimes that is hard for us to really focus on and remember is that we are no better than the next person because we are sinners. We are the imperfect ones. And so to me, what this lesson is, is saying is where's the balance? The balance in a person's life is God himself. And we receive that balance through our faith in Jesus Christ. Our seeking his forgiveness for our sins and asking him to come into our life and take control of our lives. For when he takes control of our lives, things get on the equilibrium. They get steady. And as long as we stay focused on his will and his way, then we don't get we don't tilt that scale one way or the other. So what what I see in this is that uh, our dependence upon God makes our lives dependent upon how we live. And we live for the better when we live for God. Let's have a word of prayer. Dear God, I just thank you for your word. Dear Lord, that's just, uh, this has been a, a difficult time for me to study and, and try to get across what I see is fit and what you want me to, dear Lord. But dear God, with me digging and, and trying to understand, uh, I'm getting a sense of what Solomon is trying to get across to us is that without you, we're nothing. Our life is completely out of balance. Our life is meaningless. So dear God, help us to understand that and to rely upon you daily in our lives, that there's nothing too big or too small that you can handle. And help us, dear God, to depend upon you for everything in our lives. Help us grow, dear God, in wisdom and faith. And dear God, help us to live our lives of be glorifying you daily. And we just give you praise. We love you, Lord. Amen. Next week, we're talking about facing death. Facing death. We face death every day, whether we realize it or not. Uh... If you get on uh, the highway uh, about 4.30, 5 o'clock, you understand what I'm saying. We're facing death, Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verses 1 through 10. Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verses 1 through 10. Thank you for being with me. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope it has given you some insight. And I uh, hope to see you next Sunday. Stay safe. God bless you. We love you. Bye-bye.